In this video, we're going to discuss the factors that impact a chemical reaction. As a reminder, chemical reactions are observable changes in substances. When a chemical reaction occurs, we end up with something new in the end. In order for a chemical reaction to occur, we have to have something called activation energy. The activation energy, the activation energy is the level of energy needed in order for a chemical reaction to actually begin. It's similar to when you activate a credit card or activate a new phone. It means that you're getting it to work. That happens in chemical reactions as well. So imagine if you have particles in the atmosphere and they're bouncing around, they might bump into each other. And when they bump into each other, nothing happens. But if you speed up the particles in an atmosphere, maybe with a bolt of lightning, and they hit each other with enough force, they can actually then connect and make a new substance. The reverse of that can also happen and they can be broken apart. That's a chemical reaction. If you are in your kitchen and you're trying to cook a baked potato, if you put the baked potato in an oven at 100 degrees and you leave it there, you're gonna end up with a 100 degree raw potato. You have to have a certain temperature in order for that potato to reach the activation energy and start to cook. That's why we preheat our ovens. So activation energy is absolutely necessary in order for a chemical reaction to begin. And then there are things that we can use to change the speed or to even make a chemical reaction occur or not occur. And those three factors that we're going to look at are concentration, temperature, and surface area. Concentration is how much of one substance is in another. The more substance you add to another thing, the more likely you are to get a chemical reaction. So I'm going to show you what concentration looks like going to use popcorn kernels because I have them available and water. So if I take a handful of popcorn, place it in the water, that's not very concentrated. If these were two substances that actually reacted with each other, it may or may not react. But if I add more of the substance that I'm adding to the water, then you might get a, a reaction. And that's because we've increased the concentration of popcorn in the water. Concentration is something we hear when we talk about orange juice. Orange juice concentrate means that you need to add water to dilute it. Or when you have really strong coffee, it means that it's concentrated. The opposite of concentrated is dilute. So concentration can increase the speed or the size of a reaction. We also talk about temperature. And when we talk about temperature, temperature really just measures the energy of particles. So the faster the particles in any substance are moving, the higher the temperature will be. Particles that are moving very slowly have a lower temperature. So if I take vanilla, which I also just happen to have on hand, and I place it in water, and this is room temperature water, I've done nothing but leave it sit. It will spread out pretty quickly. You'll notice, I don't know if you can see that, but a lot of it settles to the bottom. If, however, we increase the temperature, it means that the particles will move faster. And rather than trying to do that, I'm going to just stir. So what you'll find is that when you move the particles more quickly, they interact with each other at a greater rate. And that interaction is what can cause a chemical reaction to either speed up or actually occur. So when we increase the temperature, it makes the particles move faster. They come into contact with each other with more force and that can start a chemical reaction or make it happen more quickly. The other factor is surface area. Surface area is the amount of particles that, that are exposed on the outside of whatever the substance is. So when we have sugar, sugar is, this is granulated sugar, so it's little tiny particles. If I place these little tiny particles of sugar in water, it's gonna dissolve pretty quickly. If I stir it, increase the speed or the energy, that helps too. But because the particles are tiny and there's a lot of particles exposed to the water, it's gonna dissolve pretty quickly. If instead I have a sugar cube, 
then I only have this surface and this surface, these six surfaces exposed. When I drop that in water, it's gonna take a lot longer for it to actually dissolve, and that's because the particles on the inside of the sugar cube are not coming into contact with the water until it dissolves the outside. So when I place that in water, it's just gonna sit there at first until it starts to dissolve the surface particles on the outside. That's how our digestive system works as well. When you eat something, the first part of your digestive system is your teeth. It's, we chew it up and we chew it up to expose more particles. That helps our digestive system to break down that food more quickly. If you were to take a piece of pizza and be able to swallow it whole and get it into your stomach as a piece of pizza, it would take a long time for your digestive system to break down those particles because it would have to eat through the surfaces first to get to the interior surfaces. So again, these are the three things that we can use to change the speed of a chemical reaction, concentration, temperature, and surface area. Sometimes we do this in a science lab, sometimes you do it in your kitchen, sometimes it happens naturally. One more little note about temperature. You can also decrease the temperature and that will prevent sometimes things from happening. So sometimes you can take your glow stick that's having a reaction and it only glows while it's actually going through the reaction. If you place it in the freezer, it will last a little bit longer because the particles aren't interacting with each other as quickly. It's also why you can put bread in the freezer and it won't start to mold because you're preventing the particles from interacting so it doesn't actually go through that reaction. Now, these two words are also important when we talk about chemical reactions and controlling them. A catalyst is something that we can add to substances to make a chemical reaction occur or to speed it up. It's anything that makes it go faster. So heat is a good example of a catalyst. If you add heat to your oven and put a cake in the oven, it's going to start to cook and that's because heat is the catalyst. If you just place the cake in the oven and you don't turn it on, it's never gonna actually cook. And that's because you haven't added the catalyst. An inhibitor is the opposite. An inhibitor prevents something from happening. So if you, for instance, wanted to um, prevent something from molding or mildewing, you might wrap it in plastic wrap. And that's because the air then can't get to whatever it is that you're trying to protect. The plastic wrap then becomes an inhibitor. It prevents a chemical reaction from taking place. So these are terms that you have to be familiar with when it comes to how we control chemical reactions. You need to know that activation energy is the amount of energy it takes to get a, a reaction started. You need to know that concentration or the amount of one substance in another substance can change that chemical reaction. Temperature, increasing it or decreasing it can change the chemical reaction. And the amount of surface area of a substance that's exposed can change a chemical reaction. A catalyst speeds up or gets a chemical reaction started and an inhibitor will slow down or prevent a chemical reaction. Hopefully all of those terms make sense.